It's so wonderful to be able to welcome you to our second week in this bite-sized corrosion series, where we are looking at some of the main pipeline coatings. Now, pipeline coatings do seem to fill many pipeline engineers with some dread. Should they use the one they used the last time? Which coating is the best coating? How do they choose? And that's really the purpose for this series that we're doing on bite-sized corrosion is to discuss some of the major pipeline coatings in use. We did spend some time last week looking at polyethylene coatings and epoxy coatings. Let's get ourselves started on today's topic for discussion, which is looking at the polyurethane suite of coatings. Now, just to be sure, today's discussion is not a comprehensive polyurethane exhaustive look that would take us years but it's a little bit of a help to give us a grasp of what polyurethanes are and can do. Now, Neil, you were responsible for choosing a picture of a parrot for our advertising. So would you like to share your thinking in that regard? I think it comes from my scouting background that it's always useful to have some sort of image or word association or an event association in order to remember things. And the word poly in the Latin meaning many, of course, sounds just like poly, the parrot, that is the colloquial term that is often used. Parrots are not just African greys that you can see here, but also you get various types and sizes. So the word polymer, we've spoken about poly meaning many, but what about mer? Vanessa, what's that? Well, that looks like the Little Mermaid statue in Denmark. Uh, so mer, I would have said meaning sea, but maybe... Well, not, no, no. Sea is mare. So mer sure. means part. So the mermaid means part made. And I suppose you could also say she's a mer fish, although that doesn't sound quite so romantic. Here's a test for your general knowledge. What is the national symbol of Singapore? I'm not sure. I know it's on their flag. It's not only a flag, it's a working great statue. It's a mer lion, okay. meaning part lion and part fish. But anyway, that's enough trivia. <laughs> Let's get on with the subject, which is polymer, meaning many parts. Well, that part of it does make sense. I've never thought of it quite in that way. And as you say, it's helpful to have analogies. Now, polyurethanes, of course, are composed of two, primarily two components. And I did study them at university, but my brain has become, what should we say, a little rusty over the years. So I do recall that polyurethanes are a combination of polyols, which are big long chains of alcohols, and isocyanates. They were developed just before the Second World War, where they were primarily used as a replacement for rubbers, which is quite interesting considering their usage today. But I think most of us think of polyurethanes as DIY foams. Surfboards also have come to mind from my university days, and even the soles of our shoes. And so we can think of them as these very airy foams, and that doesn't seem to tie up with a coating, of course, at all. But there are a number of varying formulations, and some of them work exceptionally well as coatings. Well, the first polyurethane polymers that were used as coatings were what are generally referred to as the elastomers. And these are highly elastic materials which have very, very good impact resistance, good abrasion resistance, and good water resistance. And they were used extensively in the mining industry for abrasion resistant applications. They're still used today for that application. And so you will find that some of the older specifications actually have requirements that relate to these elastomeric, very rubbery, stretchy type of coatings. One of the challenges with those coatings, as with many other things that we've discussed, was adhesion of the material to the substrate. And some of those specifications actually still refer to an adhesion promoting primer for use underneath the polyurethane, which of course would have been most likely based on the epoxies that we discussed earlier in the series. Yes. Well, that's right, Neil. 
the different formulations can give us coatings that are flexible, like the elastomers. And in fact, some of those are even used today commercially. You might have used something in the back of your bucky. Those rubberized coatings are often polyurethanes. But the development of the rigid polyurethanes was quite significant. And that's where they came into their own in the pipeline industry, where I think they've been used for about 20 odd years. Yes, the history is not quite as long as that in South Africa, because here in South Africa, we're really conservative in many ways. And we are slow to take on developments that happen elsewhere. And rightly so, because often stuff that works in the Northern Hemisphere, where the temperatures are lower, doesn't work in our hot climates. And this happened, interestingly enough, with field joint coatings. Polyurethane foam was used extensively for cost in situ field jointing overseas. And when they first brought that to South Africa, they injected the foam into the mold and it climbed out of the mold and went everywhere else because it just reacted too fast because of our ambient temperatures. But the rigid polyurethanes have now become an accepted and well-documented system in South Africa as well. I think the material manufacturers have adapted to the South African conditions. And we have some very, very successful applications of polyurethane in the pipeline industry. The first applications internationally were urethane tar blends that were extensively used for maintenance work in the trench. And that, of course, is a very different animal, and we're not going to go there. So here in this picture, you can see some pipes that are coated with polyurethane. The internal is epoxy. We're not really talking about that at the moment. And you notice that these are, are slightly different bell shaped at the end of the pipe. The reason for this is that these pipes are actually double belled. Each end is belled, but the bell is slightly different so that the pipes actually fit into each other as you lay them and they form a joint. This joint then gets welded on the inside and you can see from this photograph the slight misalignment of the two pipes. This allows the pipes to be laid according to the natural levels and, and variations in the trench without any significant issues and without stressing the pipe. In this way, the similar advantages that we had in the flexible couplings, commonly known as Viking Johnson couplings, are found then in an all-welded pipe. The pipe then gets welded on the inside, which naturally then burns the external coating as you can see there. And this then will be removed during the field joint preparation. The external double bell is then reinforced with space welding, as you can see in the photograph. And the polyurethane is actually used to seal that crevice that is formed between the inner and outer bells of the pipe. I was wondering about that. Yeah, that's one of the advantages of the polyurethane is that it does have a certain amount of gap filling properties. Mm. Here you can see the joint that has then been prepared to uh, expose the sound material on each side. They've removed all that burnt coating, cleaned off all the flash rusting, and then at the same time, any obvious defects are prepared for repair. And you then have the applicator coming along with his mobile spray gun to spray apply the polyurethane on the joint itself. And this particular installation is taking place in Spain in fairly arid conditions and no stray currents to worry about in that part of Spain anyway. Other areas of Spain do have similar problems to us. And the system is very suitable for pipelines in the trench because you can get into the difficult spaces without having to have large foxholes Fox in mm. order to be able to apply the material. The spray painting like that really does encourage one to look at that as an option for your application for precisely that, that you don't need such a big access around the pipe. Irrespective of the method of application, you have to make sure that the joint is properly prepared and is absolutely squeaky clean prior to the application of the coating. And we'll talk a little bit more about 
profiles uh, associated with cleanliness, there's a little challenge associated with profile that we need to be aware of. So here's a chappy using a portable suction gun, abrasive blasting nozzle in order to prepare the surface. The net result of that is a, a nice clean material, a feathered edge to the polyurethane, and the masking tape on each side enables us to get a clean edge to the field joint application. That slide just shows someone all dressed ready for COVID, but I'm sure it was taken many years ago with all that PPE. Well, yes, that's a very relevant issue with polyurethanes. The two components of the polyurethane, as you mentioned, polyols being alcohols and isocyanates, well, we all know what cyanide does. And an isocyanate is also dangerous in terms of the exposure. And so you need to take the necessary precautions. But of course, once reacted, the material is completely inert and doesn't pose any health risks whatsoever. Thankfully. And just looking at that just makes me think polyurethane really has had a bit of a difficult journey to gain acceptance in the pipeline industry. And there's actually been some superb chemistry to develop what is now a suite of very robust coatings. Just thinking about that, being a polymer, the mix ratio is really critical. And the whole polymerization process depends on the right amounts of each of the components to ensure that you achieve the properties. Now, in this photograph, we've got a four to one ratio of the components in this polyurethane, and they need to be mixed in that four to one ratio, three to one or 3.8 to one or whatever other variant one might come up with is not the same as four to one. And that's something that really does need to be controlled. Supplying the components for site application as in this photograph does make that a little bit easier. And this is for spray application, but they also generate the components in different ratios. They'll have slightly different properties, but the laboratories go to a lot of trouble to develop different ratios for application conditions that might vary. So you can also get one-to-one -one ratio, as we can see in this picture. And this one is being applied in a more manual process as opposed to by being sprayed. So it's more of a liquid process. And so it needs to be a bit slower curing and ensuring again that you're mixing them correctly because that mixing ratio is going to actually affect the cure of the coating and the function of the coating. And what happens if, they're, if it's off ratio? Well, the top might be fine, but underneath, instead of being a rigid polyurethane in this specific example, it's actually a flexible polyurethane unintentionally and not adhering perhaps as well as it should have been. There's a particular example, the ratio was off so far that it, I don't know that you could even call it a polyurethane. It was chewing gum. And that can happen. And um, in the factory, it's something that needs to be watched is that the ratio is in control. And then also, if you've got unreacted isocyanate, you can also cause problems. Isocyanates are extremely hydrophilic, which means they like to attract water. So if there's isocyanate beneath the top layer of the coating and it's attracting water, you're going to get blisters forming and your coating is just going to come off like we can see in this slide here. What's interesting about this particular example is that this, what we call special, had been manufactured in a shop, in a factory, under controlled environments, and then brought to site. And it was only something like three months after it had been installed that the blistering appeared because the, the isocyanate rich blisters that formed were, it, it took time for the moisture to diffuse through the coating and form that blister. So it's a real challenge because you've got a pipe that is apparently totally acceptable from all routine quality control points of view, hardness, cure, thickness, appearance, everything, all the normal non-destructive testing that you do during application. And yet three months later, you find a problem like this. And this particular problem is due to the spray technique that is used. 
because those two components that you saw in those cartridges, whether in, they're in cartridges or not, the two components have very different viscosities. Mm -hmm. And if you trigger a spray gun during the application process or release a spray gun, you will then inevitably get an isocyanate rich spot in a coating, which is a future defect. It's effectively mm -hmm. a latent defect that you cannot see. Mm. That is a problem, but there are methods, I think, now being implemented in many of the factories to avert this disaster from happening. Don't they spray off the pipe first before they spray onto the pipe? Correct. So you trigger the spray gun off the target, and then you spray continuously while you're on the target, the target being the component that you're wanting to coat, and then you would spray off the target before releasing the trigger of the spray gun. And that'll stop the, the lack of control over your mix ratio to a large extent. And Neil, adhesion testing can be used though to, to verify whether it's sticking adequately? Correct. The adhesion of the polyurethane when it's correctly mixed, correctly applied and all the rest of it is excellent. And here you can see the result of a direct stress adhesion test on a, a polyurethane coating and apart from the slight rim around the edge where the glue actually came off the top layer of the polyurethane you can see that the polyurethane has failed that's a, in, in inverted commas because of this test is a test to failure doesn't mean that the coating has failed so the coating has failed under direct stress pull at a value well in excess of the minimum requirement and the failure mode is within the polyurethane itself so it hasn't come off the substrate so in this case this adhesion test is a, a pass with a tick so i guess when it sticks it really does stick which is different from how it was in the very early days one of the advantages that is often touted about polyurethanes is that they cure incredibly quickly but that can also be a bit of a disadvantage i think yeah, the, this is uh, an example of a coating which cured too quickly. And you can see on the back of this adhesion test, the imprint of the profile. And you can see that the material has not actually flowed into the profile. So viscosity, which is related to temperature, also substrate temperature, and of course, the profile of the substrate if that was too high it would also tend to prevent the material from flowing into all the nooks and crannies of the profile in order to give you the adhesion so again like we have said before with all coatings you have to play by the rules now, the laws of physics don't change because you've got a production deadline to meet and sometimes i think we wish they did the other aspect of adhesion is that these polyurethane materials prefer to be applied in a single application. This cut that has been made through a coating that failed shows the clear interface between a number of layers that had been mm. applied. And in this case, the inference is that the second coat was applied after the first coat had fully cured. And then there were no hooks, no chemical hooks for the coating to latch onto. And so we landed up with an intercoat failure in the adhesion of this particular coating. But that goes for any chemically cured coating. Epoxies have exactly the same problem. I think it goes back to what you said a little while ago. If you play within the rules, it'll work. And it's when you break the rules that the coating itself will break. Neil, in the field though, um, polyurethanes, certainly with uh, cathodic protection, do perform very well. I mean, we do have other coatings that aren't happy with cathodic protection, but cathodic protection, AC, DC interference, um, polyurethanes do seem to perform really well. Yes, we've got some, some really good case histories of polyurethanes in the field. As with the other high performance coatings, and when I say high performance, I'm talking specifically about their electrical resistance characteristics. We have the challenge that if there is a damage 
to the coating that because of the high electrical resistance of the coating, any stray current interference, be it AC or DC, is concentrated into very small areas. And therefore, a fairly innocuous looking chip out of the coating can result in significant metal loss if you do not have temporary protection on the pipeline during construction. And we can't overemphasize that in, in all of these coatings that we're talking about is that the coatings are not forgiving. And so you've got to make sure that the pipeline is well protected from the moment it hits the ground. I think that's a plug for temporary cathodic protection, ad break alert. <laughs> and we've, <laughs> yeah. we've discussed temporary cathodic protection in some of our previous webinars. So you're welcome to go back to those. I feel as though we've been slamming polyurethane a, a little bit today, and I really didn't want that to be what you take away from our discussion. Once you're dealing with well-controlled mix ratios, polyurethanes are easy to apply to virtually every size of pipe, which is really beneficial. There's relatively little constraint in that regard. And of course, it's very easily prepackaged into either squish packs, which are exactly what they sound like, you squish them together and hand apply, um, or into cartridges for spraying in use on field joint coatings. And that makes the repairs on site relatively easy, again, within the constraints of the rules of polyurethanes. And surface preparation is critical. It's critical for polyurethanes, it was critical for epoxies, and it'll be critical for others as well. So I don't think that should really be a detractor. And just to say that, as in this photograph, there are many, many kilometers of high-performing polyurethanes that are laid in our own country. That's right. <laughs> and there, there's a, a particularly interesting case study where a section of the pipeline was protected using sacrificial anodes for a um, particular reason. And the balance of the pipeline was supposedly protected with impressed current systems. And due to vandalism, which rendered the, the impressed current systems inoperative, the 60 kilometer pipe was protected by a 10 kilometer section of sacrificial anodes. So it goes to show that the, the polyurethane coating was extremely effective in the role in which it was designed. And the challenges that we've been talking about with polyurethane go for all um, heavy duty coatings, pipeline coatings, above ground coatings, all coatings. The days of old where we used to slap red lead onto a wire brushed surface in order to prevent corrosion are gone. We're not allowed to use red lead anymore. We're not allowed to use zinc chromate anymore. Now we wouldn't have used those on the pipeline anyway, but the principle is that, that as we've gone to more and more high-tech coatings, we have to be, to be meticulous in their application to make sure that the conditions of application are met so that they can perform to their ability. Absolutely. And I'm hoping that today's discussion will give some more confidence to our fellow engineers who've joined us that they're feeling a little bit more empowered and feeling like this big back box of pipeline coatings has had some light shone on it. Now, Neil, a question I've been pondering for several years, in fact, has also been raised from the floor. And that is whether we have that double barrel pipe that you showed at the beginning, the blue one, whether that is available, manufactured, um, is there installation experience here in our country? Uh, as far as I know, not. I don't know whether that particular pipe jointing system is patented by Noxol in Spain or not, but we do certainly have spigot and socket welded pipe available in South Africa. So which, is the, similar which is similar, but it doesn't have the same joint rotation or joint alignment flexibility that the double bell system offers. So if anybody's interested in doing it, Certainly the pipe manufacturers have the ability to form bells and it would be a case of getting hold of, of Noxol and seeing whether it is in fact a, a patented system or not. 
I can certainly see some use for it. Yeah, so just to end off today's discussion and just say uh, thank you for attending. And I hope that, that this little brief foray into polyurethanes does give you some confidence that it is a good coating and can be used. And in a couple of sessions time, next week, Wednesday, we will be having a closer look at what coating we choose for which application. And I think that will be quite an interesting discussion. Have a good afternoon.